Holly Shippers. I'm the manager of seasonal as well as the house plants. Um, I would like to uh, thank you for sharing some of your morning with us here at Sunnyside Nursery. Today's topic is house plants. I like to do a little history test if at all possible. So here it goes. Here's a little history on house plants. Uh, 2,000 years ago, and don't worry, we're not going to take it year by year till present date. 2,000 years ago, house plants were kind of more of an outdoor plant for the house, for the courtyard, for the kitchen. Uh, this was in Rome, Greece, China, and Egypt. Uh, jumping forward, 1600s, it became more popular to, hey, why don't we try something in the house? Uh, maybe something prettier than the, the fruit trees and the herbs and the vegetables previously grown 2,000 years ago. Something pretty. Walk through the woods, there's a fern. Hey, how about that? 1660s, it got really popular to be able to have houseplants in your houses. They were called house decorations. Let's move into the 1800s. The 1800s really blew up for the houseplant. Uh, industry. Um, a man by the name of Nath Nathaniel Ward, he was a botanist, he decided he wanted to do a study on moths, but he had to figure out what kind of a containment he could build to do this study. So he came up with these big glass cases or boxes called Wardy Wardian cases. Um, it, it was an environment that he had created for these moths so he could study them. Well, needless to say, the moths did not fare well, but boy, those ferns were gorgeous. These are what we call terrariums today. Now terrariums, what they do is you start with a moist soil. The plant brings that moisture up through its foliage, disperses it in the air. It then collects on the glass walls, slides down, goes back into the soil and repeats itself. So it's it sustains, uh, they sustain themselves. Um, he's thinking, okay, what can I do with something like this? It didn't do well for the moths, but it's doing pretty good for the plants. Well, they started using those to transport plants from other countries. So in the 1800s, they're suddenly getting plants from these countries they maybe never heard of before, will never see. Um, and it just became a big thing. They can last, plants can last up to three months being shipped from all these countries on, on, on ships. Um, then it became very popular for the wealthy because what happens when you're shipping plants rather than just going out to the woods or the yard to pick something and put in a pot for inside, it's gonna cost money. So it became very popular for the wealthy then. It was a status symbol for the wealthy to have these more exotic plants as house plants. He really blew it up. Uh, then we get into the 1950s. It's like, okay, we've got these house plants. Everybody has these issues with pests, with fungal issues, whatever. Maybe we need to have products for indoor plants as well. That's when they started manufacturing pesticides, fertilizers, but they forgot to put instructions on them. So that quickly changed. They then put labels with instructions on how to use these products. Then we move into the, let's move into the 1980s. Uh, that was a bit of a confusing era. Uh, I can tell you, I went through punk, grunge, heavy metal, and then I had all those bright fluorescent pink and orange and green clothing. Remember those popcorn, Fishing lure earrings, oh yeah, it was a confused era. We didn't have time for house plants. So that melted into the 90s. We had to get back on our feet and figure out what we wanted. So fake plants, we'll just do fake plants. That was the 90s. Then 2010, finally, the millennials figured out, okay, NASA has put out this uh, research paper on house plants and how they can benefit and purify our air. Hmm, well, that seems a little healthy. Let's, let's, let's think towards the healthy. Purifying the air. Well, what needs to be purified out of the air? Your air has toxins or pollutants or also known as VOCs, volatile organic compounds that are just kind of floating around 
what causes these? Some things could be benzene, uh, fl 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 fraldehyde, xylene. What are these? Well, these are found in all of your homes. They could be in the building materials. They can be in the upholstery, the carpet, the stain on your furniture, the plastics in your house. It can go on and on and on. It's just part of what we have around us. Uh, how does it work? Well, plants have a gas. All plants are air purifiers. Some emit more gases than others. Uh, that gas will be emitted in the air. It absorbs those uh, toxins or VOCs back into its foliage. It will then go down through into the soil's microbes. Microbes are small living things. They, uh, the most common would be bacteria, virus, fungi, and protozoa. Um, okay, so you've decided you want a house plant. Now what? Where do I want my house plant? If it's in a corner away from a window, then that would be considered low light. If it's kind of out in the middle of the room with windows around, that would be your medium light. If it's in a window, indirectly from that window by a few feet, that would be your highlight or your bright light. So you've decided where to put it. You've decided what plants now, how do you take care of it? Well, tropical plants, most of them will, will like to be watered after the first couple inches are dry. Um, cactus, they like to dry out in between watering and stay dry for a while. Succulents, same kind of thing. Um, then there's some plants that require staying moist. They don't want to be sopping wet. They just want to be evenly moist, like the spathophyllums. They like that. So you've decided on what your plant is, how you're going to water it. Um, what about the temperature? Most house plants are happy with temperatures between 65 and 75 degrees. So you've got your temperature set. What kind of soil do I need to transplant? What kind of soil do I need if I want to put it in a new pot? Let's see. So for your um, tropicals, a basic uh, uh, indoor outdoor potting soil would work that has um, either cocoa core or peat in it to help retain moisture. For your cactus succulents, there is cactus succulent uh, soil that would have extra sand, extra pumice or perlite added for uh, uh, better drainage. Then if you have an African violet that requires a little more moisture, it's got a little more of the peat and or cocoa core added. And then you have a medium called orchid bark. Orchid bark is for your orchids, obviously. It allows the air to get to the, to the roots that the orchids uh, require. So you've decided on the soil. How about fertilizer? Fertilizer is an important thing for your house plants to give it nutrients. Um, uh, water soluble, meaning uh, one that will dissolve and mix in water, will do very well for a house plant. You want to make sure with house plants you are not watering or sorry, fertilizing uh, fall and winter. You only want to fertilize spring and summer. The reason for this is house plants as well as outdoor plants require the fall and winter to generate and store new energy for the spring when it's time to grow again. Um, so after you fertilize, you, you know, time goes on, the plants get larger. Hmm, do I need to pot it up into something a little bit bigger? If so, you don't want to go too much bigger or you'll create a lot of extra soil that will keep the plant wet longer. Do I want to take cuttings? Is it just getting full and bushy? Do I want to take cuttings? Um, we here like to take cuttings. And when you do that, what you're doing is putting it in a bowl of water. Let me, I disappeared on you. And then it starts to sprout little roots, whoops, 
little roots. You can see them just starting. This got clipped about a week ago, so it's got little nubbins starting on it. Another week and it'll have much larger nubbins, more, more of a root. And this aglaonema, see we did the same thing. Let's hope, hopefully you'll be able to see it. There's little nubbins. I know, where's my finger? There we go. That's eh, a little hard to see, but those will turn into hairy roots. You can also divide them. If your plant might be in still in its plastic container and look what's happening. It's uh, pushing through. This is where you'd want to take it out, either put it in a larger container, again, not too much larger, or divide this up. And you'd take this out and you would go through and you'd see where, where you can divide. And you'll just kind of massage and break that apart. And then you can either put them in different pots or you know, give some to your friends or your neighbors. It's really easy to do. If you're not sure, you can come on in and we can do it for you or show you how it's done. Um, let's see, uh, pests, you're going to get pests. Uh, House plants, think about it. They're getting taken out of their native cultural area. They're getting shipped to us in these dark boxes, whether it's airplane, boat, train, truck. They're getting banged around. They're getting shoved into a new environment. They're going to stress. It's called cultural stress, um, and they will get buggy. We have product for that. That's It's nature. It happens. It happens indoor. It happens outdoor. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Don't let it get out of control, though. The minute you notice something, um, make sure you find out what you need for that situation. The most common pests would be mealybug, aphids, scale, gnats. That's just roughly off the top of my head. Um, you want to make sure what I do is uh, I go along and I'll shine my foliage. You want to clean the foliage so that you can get, get those gases out and those toxins in. As I'm doing that, I do it maybe once a week. Um, I make sure I look for bugs. So just get in those crevices, get under the foliage and look for any of the, the, the bugs. Um, let's see, we covered that, that and that. You know, if you, if you follow the rules, they won't be a problem. You just have to keep up on, on the pests. Um, and the watering and the soil and the uh, uh, potting. Uh, let's talk about some of these plants. Um, since that's what you're really here for, you wanna see all the fun stuff. This is Tradescantia Velvet Hills. It's really fuzzy. This is going to grow and kind of become a hanging plant. This is just a, a youngin. This is Tradescantia, just Tradescantia purple. It's got a green, fuzzy, purple and green foliage on the top side, kind of a purple underside. This too will hang and be a nice, beautiful hanging plant. This one is Tradescantia fluminensis. It's a bright, bright green, beautiful and uh, white variegation. Kind of a, kind of a, I don't know, a sublime and green variegation. This too will be a hanging plant as it grows up. Here is Nanook, Tradescantia Nanook. I hope you're seeing better color than I am on this screen. This one is a green, pink and white variegated foliage on top pink and green variegated foliage on the underside. Again, eventually a hanging plant. This is a red dracaena. You can see it's a lot darker on the top foliage as the others and much redder on the underside. It gives you an idea on its form how the others are going to grow. And these are the little flowers. They're little pale pink flowers. Hey, Holly. Yeah. Can you tell us what light conditions these all like? 
I can. A Tratascansha can take an indirect light uh, or to a medium light. Let's see, let's look at these. These are Dracaena. Dracaena can vary on their light. This one, believe it or not, is a Dracaena. This is gold dust. Gold dust can take um, an indirect bright light. It's got that uh, beautiful speckling on it. It's kind of a yellowy cream with green speckling. This will turn into more of a shrub. This is Dracaena gold dust. Now this is a red Dracaena, totally different, isn't it? This is a, a beautiful little red Dracaena. This is going to turn into a tall spiky bush as well. This one can take um, indirect bright light. It, uh, if, if, if it's in less light, you lose the red and it turns green. This is Dracaena, red Dracaena. Then we get into the, the, the cut ones. You can see there's three stumps in here. This is called Dracaena marginata. You see these quite often in office buildings. And uh, they're very easy to care for. This, this one can take more of a lower light. It can take bright light, but it can take also a lower light because it's just gonna stay green. Dracaena marginata. This one is Dracaena warnickii, also known as uh, lemon lime. You can see the beautiful variegation. This is going to grow into a shrubby, bushy, beautiful plant. This needs to be in a bright light because of that variegation. Um, if you don't care if it has that variegation, put it in a low light, it'll just turn green. Uh, this one is Dracaena warnickii. Beautiful. They can, get, you that? can you also maybe give us uh, what kind of water these also like? The Dracaenas like to dry out in between watering. The Tritoscantia would be that two inch dry rule on top. And here we have Anthurium. Anthurium like to stay evenly moist. They come in all kinds of colors. This is their flower. They come in reds, pinks, different shades of pinks, white, cream, and uh, one that is called black. It's not quite black black, but it's pretty darn close. And uh, lavender would be another. Here's another anthurium. See the difference in color? Now this one eventually be, will be a larger plant, larger flower, larger foliage. This is just a baby, but those are gorgeous. Again, evenly moist soil. And uh, these like bright light. That's anthurium. Now here's something a lot different than the other anthuriums I just showed you. This is another anthurium. This is Anthurium superbum. Very pretty. These, the foliage will get larger. So if you want some sort of a big foliage plant, you can see it's that waffling. This one uh, can take an evenly moist soil or the, it'll also be happy with the two inch rule. As long as it doesn't dry completely out. Uh, this would also like a nice bright light. Um, it's known more for its foliage than its flower. The flower is just kind of an in insignificant spike. Um, I would typically cut those out and just enjoy the, the foliage. The backside is kind of a burgundy. Very decorative. Here we have some crotons. Crotons like to dry out in between watering. Now, if you start to see it nod or the leaves are just slightly drooping, don't wait till they're totally hang down. That's telling you okay, I'm ready now to bring up some water. You can go ahead and water me. These like a nice indirect bright light. You can see there's beautiful striping and speckling. 
on the foliage of this one. This one will get about three feet tall. This is another one. Look at the little spoons on the end of the foliage. Very, very cute. Little spoons all over. Very decorative, beautiful bright reds, pinks, yellows, and greens. And this one will probably get about three feet as well. Really cool plant. Here we have another croton. This is an oak leaf croton. And remember, they like to dry out in between watering in direct bright light. Beautiful with all the red foliage. You can kind of get an idea, since this is so young, you can get an idea why it's called an oak leaf. That's kind of more of a shape of an oak leaf. As it matures, it'll get more leaves that shape. Beautiful colors. Here we have a polka dot plant. Beautiful pink and green speckling. These get nice and full. These are great for a tabletop. They don't get too tall. Um, these like, these go for that uh, two inch rule. Obviously that'll be too dry for this one. So just, you know, a, let the top dry a little bit and then water. Uh, they come in all kinds of colors. Like I said, it's they're great for a tabletop. They just, they, they turn into a mound in your pot. So you have a little cupcake. This is another one. This is a pale pink and green. Very cute. These like to have a more um, indirect bright light. This one is a hot pink and green speckling. There's also some that are white and green. I just don't have one right now. Philodendron. This is a popular one. This is Philodendron monstera split leaf. You can see why it's called a split leaf. This particular one's on a stump. There's different varieties. There's also some that just stay nice and bushy. Um, a lot of people like the stumps or the uh, the ones that are on stumps. You can keep them more narrow uh, for a smaller space. Uh, these require some indirect bright light. Uh, they like to have the first couple of inches dry before watering. Philodendron monstera split leaf. This is Philodendron Swiss cheese. Gee, how to get that name? Swiss cheese. It looks like your Swiss cheese. Indirect bright light. This one's going to be more of a spilling out hanging plant style. Just fun and different. Uh, indirect bright light and um, again the two inch rule. Now here's a totally different looking philodendron. Isn't that beautiful? We've got all kinds of colors. I hope you can see those colors. We've got red on the new stem, red striping. The new uh, uh, foliage is white and then it turns striped and then they start to become more green. This is Philodendron Birkin. Beautiful, beautiful plant in direct bright light and the two inch rule. Philodendron Birkin. Now this is something I do at home. I love Rex begonias. They come in so many different colors. They are the coolest thing. I have them in my yard in containers half the year and then they go into my husband's office for the other half to be stored. They are not hardy for outside, but they're fine in the spring and summer once the temperatures are up. Beautiful, beautiful foliage. Look at the size of that and the colors in that. They come in all kinds of colors. This is the flower. This is the bud. It'll open up a little more. The, they get big. Mine are, mine are huge now. I just love these. One of my favorites. Rex begonias like to have uh, that two inch again rule. Here's another Rex begonia. This one's a gorgeous red with a 
dark center to it. And there's the flower. So these, these have a multi-purpose. Half the year they're outside, half the year they're inside. Beautiful Rex begonia. Here we have ficus. This is ficus tinnicky. It's a beautiful variegation with some pink in there and cream, a little kind of a, a bluey gray, uh, green color as well. Really pretty, pretty, pretty plant. It's got a pink casting underside. These are um, going to get tall. They like a, a nice bright light. If you, uh, again, if you have it in low light, you're gonna lose the beauty of it. It'll still live. You'll just use the reason why you bought it. That's uh, ficus tiny. Here is ficus elastica burgundy. Again, beautiful, deep, dark foliage. The new leaf buds are red. You've got kind of a red veining up the center. Beautiful, shiny, glossy foliage. Uh, uh, ficus like to dry completely out and then be watered again. They do like that in direct bright light. Beautiful, beautiful. Ficus elastica burgundy. Here we have ficus uh, lorata fiddle leaf. Fiddle leaf because the leaves are kind of the shape of a fiddle. I mean, it's a little bit exaggerated, but that's that's why it's fiddle. That's ficus lorata fiddle leaf. Beautiful leaves. The leaves as it matures is gonna they're gonna get bigger. Uh, Ficus, uh, uh, not ficus, yeah, ficus um, fiddle leaf like to be in a bright window. These really, really like the brightness. Um, if you put them in too low of a light, they're going to start to yellow on you. Uh, they do need to dry completely through. So again, in uh, bright light, these can get big. Now I have one that every few years I just cut it down and let it reflush because it gets way too big. Beautiful uh, ficus lorata, Italy. This is ficus benjamina. A lot of you know what these are. A lot of you have had these. A lot of you have had them defoliate. They're a little bit picky. Ficus lorata do not like to have drafty areas, so don't put it by a window or a door. Um, they don't like to be overwatered. These are all reasons why they would defoliate. Uh, so let it dry out in between watering and a bright light. Ficus benjamina. Here we have ficus ginseng. These were typically used as a bonsai plant. You see it's in a shallow pot. It's got that great stump, the trunk. Beautiful canopy and foliage on it. Ficus ginseng, great as a bonsai plant, or, or if you don't want a bonsai. Here we have orchid, Philanopsis orchid. Now, a lot of people have trouble with this. When they come in, in these, don't leave them in these pots. They need to go into an orchid pot with orchid bark. Orchids are epiphytes. They live in the crooks or on the branches of trees. So very important that once you get them, they come out of these plastic containers and into a proper orchid pot. Um, let them dry in between watering. When they're done flowering, you want to put them in a lower light situation so that they can uh, bud up again. You don't want to cut the stem completely away. Go to a node right there 
and cut cut above it. Leave a few inches. Don't go all the way down to the last one. Leave a few inches. Orchid Philanopsis. Sense of areas. This one is Zelanica. You can see it's got um, kind of a ripple pattern on it. It is smooth, it's just the pattern. These are also known as mother-in-law snake tubs. Mm -hmm. Very easy to take care of. They like to dry completely out. They, um, they can take both bright light or low light depending on which one. If it's one that's just green, that can take either one because it's just gonna be green. Uh, if it's one that is more uh, colored, like this one is, or like the Laurentii is, those need to be in a bright light, dry completely through. And then when you water, as long as it's dried all the way through to the bottom, and stay dry for a little while, then give it a soaking. Most of your plants that you have to dry completely through and let stay dry for a while, you don't just put a little cup of water on top, you soak it completely through and then repeat the process. Here we have a golden pothos, very popular. Green and yellow speckling variegation you can see it is a hanging plant. Uh, it will get longer, very easy to clip away. Just go in through the stem and clip above a leaf stem. That's all you have to do. These like to be in an indirect bright to low light or medium light area. They dry, need to dry out in between watering or they'll rot. They can easily rot on you. It's a, a golden pothos. Here is another variegated pothos. This is Marble Queen. It's more of a white and green variegation. Same watering conditions, dry out completely, then water. Uh, indirect bright light, and it will be a hanging plant as well. Pothos Marble Queen. Yeah, I already showed you one of those. Let's see. Let's head to ferns. I don't know if you can see this one from there. I don't want to grab it down. This is your typical Boston fern. In the south, you see them on the porches. Here we bring them inside. Uh, very nice, long, beautiful fern. This is a Boston fern. Uh, moisture. They like an even moisture and a low light. Here we have, I love this one. This is called a rabbit's foot fern. I call it the tarantula fern. These are the roots. They're fuzzy like tarantula legs. This is going to stay a nice low fern. It's really cool as it matures. Eventually you won't see this pot. It will be covered with these little tarantula legs. Now you can see that the fern will continue growing off of those roots. So eventually in time, this whole pot will just be a ball of fern. Really pretty. Again, evenly moist and low light. Rabbit's foot fern. Here we have a terrace fern. Really slender variegated foliage. There's quite a large variety of terrace ferns. They're commonly known as ribbon ferns because they look a little ribbony. I don't know if you can see that variegation, but very pretty. Something different in a fern. It grows nice and straight and upright. Here we have an asparagus fern. Just really dainty, lacy, frilly fern. And it will get larger. Again, uh, evenly moist, low light. This is an asparagus fern. Here 
Here's a fun one. This is called an eyelash fern. See, they look like eyelashes. This will turn into a, a, a bit of a mounded fern, evenly moist. This one will not be happy if it dries out. A nice, evenly moist, low light. Really cool, different type of fern. Here's another one called Crispy Wave. This is an asplenium. You can kind of see how the foliage comes out of the center and matures, and then it produces more. As it comes out, it will get fuller and wider. You can see why it's called Crispy Wave. It's a very stiff foliage and very ripply or wavy. This is a very popular fern as well. Evenly moist and low light. Crispy wave fern. Another thing that's popular are calatheas. Calatheas, this one's called jungle cat. Uh, they have very decorative foliage. There are many, many different types of calatheas. I'm hoping you're seeing that pattern. And the underside is burgundy, kind of a burgundy red, depending. Jungle cat, Calathea jungle cat. They do like humidity. What I do is I put this green moss on top. They like, uh, they like regular moisture, evenly moist. Um, what this moss does is it helps keep humidity in. Now, a lot of your tropical plants are going to want uh, to either be misted, spritzed or sprayed, same kind of concept, or you can have a humidifier in your house so there's moisture in the air, um, or a bowl or something of water or a tray, you know, anything where the water will evaporate and get to the plant as well, just a you know, bowl of water at the bo bottom of the plant, however, however way you want to do it. Humidity is very important though for your tropical plants. This is a Calathea Beauty Star. This one has pink and yellow and uh, green striped foliage. Kind of a purple underside. Again, humidity and evenly moist for this. They do like a bright light. That is Calathea Beauty Star. Here is Calathea rattlesnake. See that beautiful pattern there? Each one's repeating that pattern. This one is a bright green and dark green with a reddish burgundy underside. Again, evenly moist and humidity. This is Calathea rattlesnake. Here's another fun Calathea. This is Setosa. Setosa is more of a stiffer upright one. It's got a blue, gray, green foliage to the top and kind of a purpley reddish color on the underside. It's in a very uh, peaty soil to keep it evenly moist. Looks like we still need to put the collar on this of moss. Calathea setosia. So I mentioned earlier about spathophyllums liking to be evenly moist. This is a spathophyllum. These flowers will eventually open into big spoon-like flowers. They, they stay in bloom for some time. They, uh, they're a really beautiful plant. A spathophyllum, gorgeous plant. Here's an aerobica. Aerobica, that's coffee. Yes, it is. They do a great job as a house plant. They get little white flowers on them. I find that if I give mine a trim that will force them to flower, I've had coffee beans. I haven't, I don't drink coffee, but it's still fun that you've grown coffee beans. <laughs> These will get fairly tall. Again, you can keep them a certain size. This is aerobica coffee bean. 
Okay, let's get into some, uh, some Pileas. This one is called Silver Tree Pilea. It's kind of a bronzy, silvery pattern on it. This, uh, it, this was a one that won't get too terribly big. Um, I don't know how detailed you can see it, but it's actually in bloom. See that center? It's a little fuzzy. That's the bloom. And this one, oh, we already did that one. Here we have albuca, also known as frizzle sizzle. Albu albucas are bulbs. So keep in mind at some point, if there's a drop in temperature in your home, they're gonna say, okay, time to go dormant, but they will be back. There's just such a fun conversation piece. They do get larger than this. That's albuca frizzle sizzle. They need to um, dry out between watering, but not stay dry. If they stay dry, you're going to lose that curl. This is an alocasia. Alocasia is like a nice, evenly um, uh, even uh, soil. This one's called alocasia bambino, so it's not going to be one of the bigger ones. It's going to be one of the smaller ones. Another name for them is African mask. And it's got such a, a great long foliage, great variegation. It's kind of got a, a purpley burgundy underside. These like some bright light. Really cute, Alocasia bambino. This is one of my favorites. <clears throat> you can tell my favorites are the ones with a lot of color. This is um, stromanthi. Stromanthi has this really hot pinky red underside. Uh, this, I have one right in a southwestern window. It is as happy as can be. The brighter the light, the brighter the color. Uh, it likes to stay evenly moist. They're not happy if they dry completely out. Remember, as bright a window as you can have, you'll be just amazed at how the color changes with all that light. Uh, one thing you have to remember, they wake, they go to sleep at night. So all of a sudden you'll be sitting there and this is what happens to me. There's that stromanthi over here and all of a sudden it gets dark and all the leaves go boink. <laughs> so there's something moving over there. It's your stromanthi. They, they go upright uh, when it gets dark out and then when it's bright light they open up again. But they are very active. Gorgeous plant. I've actually had mine bloom. Oh, here's another pilea. This is known as Chinese money. This is a fun one. It'll get bigger than this. Uh, pil pil the pileas like to dry out in between watering and they like a bright light. This is pilea Chinese money plant. Aloe, people love aloe. I get a lot of people in that say, do you have aloe vera? Aloe vera is um, what is used for skin irritations. Um, I personally drink aloe vera juice. It's for in internal inflammation as well. Um, I, I get it already processed at the grocery store. But this is aloe vera. Now these do get big. Uh, this is gonna be one of your really good air purifiers, as well as the mother-in-law, the snake tons, the sen sense of areas and the ficus, uh, fiddle leaf and elasticus. This is um, going to get mine. I have four of these. They started out this big, now they're this big. So make sure you have room for them. <laughs> um, they, uh, they do, when they bloom, which mine bloom twice a year, you're in for a lot of babies. Because once they bloom, they pop out all these babies. And then they can be transplanted, but you can't transplant them until they get to a certain size and a certain amount of blades. So when that happens to you, come on in and we'll give you a little little one-on-one -on -one information about that. Aloe, aloe vera. Okay, this is an aloe. This one's called white fox. It's a uh, green and white speckled. You can see it's getting ready to bloom. These will get bigger. This is a small um, plant. Let dry completely through. Let's stay dry for a while. Bright light. 
aloe white box. This is a really cool one too. This one is aloe pink blush. I don't know if you can see that, but there's a coral pink edge and some coral pink steckling in there, along with some uh, bright green and dark green colors. That is aloe pink blush getting ready to bloom. Eschevarias, another popular succulent. This one's Black Prince. It's a nice dark Eschevaria. This would be treated as a dry completely through and bright light plant. And this one is an Eschevaria topsy-turvy. You can see where it gets the name. See how those leaves are all curled up? That's topsy-turvy Eschevaria. Dry completely through, let's stay dry for a bit, and bright light. Here's some popular ones. These are prayer plants, also marantas. This is a red maranta. It's got red veining with two tones of green. Look at this, a gorgeous pattern on that. And this has a reddish underside. These are also going to be a plant that's going to stand up and spread out and freak you out a little bit. I like them. These like to um, be uh, the, that two inch rule. And these can't be in too bright of a light. If they are, they'll lose that coloring. This is going to grow more as a um, like a hanging plant. It's going to kind of spill over. It's fine for a tabletop. That is Maranta, red Maranta. This is a green Maranta. We've got some great foliage plants here. Green Maranta has kind of a, a whitish silvery green underside. Again, that two inch rule and not too bright of light. Green Maranta. Peperomias, another popular, I have so many houseplants are popular. This one is a uh, Peperomia frost. It's kind of got that grayish frosted look to it. Great thick foliage. Peperomia frost. This is Peperomia peacock. Kind of a Striping in that foliage as well, a little red striping. You can see it's blooming. Peperomia peacock. Let, uh, let them dry out between watering. Peperomia happy beans. You see they look like beans and they're pretty darn happy. Let them dry completely out to bright light. This one is uh, Grevolens peperomia. See how it's got these curled up leaves? They're green on top and they're kind of a reddish underside, very showy. Dry completely through and bright light. These are popular. These are spider plants. There's the curly one that this is. This would be treated as a hanging plant once it matures. These will just stay very curly. Uh, they need to dry in between watering. If they don't, you get, you get that. That can just be clipped off. There are also some uh, spider plants that are more straight foliaged. They will all get that long stem out of them that will have the baby spiders. Those can be planted once they get to a certain age. Release them from home. Spider plant, dry out, bright light. Let's get into the string series. I've got a few strings. I've got more, of course, in house plants. This one is string of pearls. All those little pearls and these strings are just going to keep going and keep going. They like to dry out completely between watering. 
sometimes I'll see that the pearls are getting a little puckery. It's like, okay, it's time to fill them up with water. String of pearls, dry out bright light. Okay, here's a fun one. Let's see if we can get you to see these. String of dolphins. Let's see if I can, there's a dolphin. We've got dolphins all over this. String of dolphins. Here's another dolphin. And this too will get long with all these do dolphins hanging off of it. Dry completely through bright light. Okay, string of hearts. See the little hearts all over those? Now this is the flower. Kind of a pinkish flower with a dark tip to it. Beautiful variegated heart-shaped foliage. This too will have those strings and get quite long. Completely dried out, bright light. Well, we're getting down there. How about a Neanthabella palm? This is a, a typical palm that you would have. It's, it's a very full, very beautiful, very delicate and dainty. Um, these like to do that 2% or uh, two inch rule as well. Um, keep in mind, if you've got a gigantic one in a gigantic pot, um, that's going to be a lot of wet soil. So kind of keep an eye on on, on that. Um, I like to get my finger in there. That's the best meter ever. This is um, bright light. Neanthabella palm. This is a areca palm. You can see it's a much thicker foliage. It's a much sturdier stem. Two inch rule, bright light. These will get big. It's an areca palm. Okay, we just have a couple more here. This is a ponytail palm or a ponytail stump. You can see where it's been cut and that's where it starts uh, uh, sprouting its foliage. Ponytail palm or stump. It's got that beautiful curling to it. It's really a fun plant. Uh, dry completely through bright light. Ponytail palm. Okay, this is the pickle plant. Pickle? We got happy beans and now we got pickles. These will get taller and they will get fatter and they're just fun. Little, little, uh, cute little pattern there. It's a succulent. It's going to want to dry completely out and be in bright light. Here we have burrow's tail succulent. It's kind of a cartoon character burrow tail maybe. These do get longer. They are treated as a hanging plant. Dry completely through, bright light. Burrow's tail uh, uh, succulent. And this is a purple waffle. It is quite purpley and bronzy. The foliage looks waffly. These get larger. This is a young one. The underside is that beautiful purpley color. These like to dry uh, through and then be watered. Bright light. Okay, I think we've covered all the plants. Um, before we get to questions, I do want to uh, let you know that we will be starting wreaths. We are either going to have them in-house for uh, curbside pickup. Uh, we do have class rooms set up for small groups where you can social distance. You must call to sign up for that and there are requirements. Um, and we do online shipping. So different ways of getting some beautiful handmade wreaths. Uh, questions before we get started on that, Nicole, I have an email from a Katie Norton who is asking about her bromeliad not blooming. There could be various reasons for that. Uh, first, they are monocarpic, so when one blooms, that one's done. The pups that come out of it will be the next ones to bloom. It might take them two or three years to bloom. 
If you've gone that far and they haven't bloomed yet, you can do things like feed them kelp. They love liquid kelp. You can create a little loose greenhouse for them over the plant um, with an apple slice or a banana slice or a kiwi slice in there. That's going to release a gas called ethylene that will help it to bloom. So different things you can do and in different circumstances. And uh, you also, Katie, said that you've got a um, hibiscus that you want repotted that's quite large and root pruned. We can do that here for you. Um, you were concerned about picking it up because it's so heavy. We do have a delivery service. I'm sure we can pick it up. It would be for a, a fee and you would need to call so we can set that up for you. Okay, all right, questions? So before we spring into questions, I know we're getting close to an hour here. So if you have to leave, we are recording this so you can see it later or go back and rewatch information, pause, write, you know, notes, whatever it is that you'd like to do. This will be posted up on our website either later today or tomorrow, sunnysidenursery.net slash classes. Um, so we're going to do our best to get through these questions. And if anything pops up, feel free to always shoot us an email to or give us a phone call. We'd love to chat with you. Um, our email is sunnysidenursery at msn.com. Um, so Holly, our first question is um, somebody's got a handful of house plants and they've recently noticed small black, what kind of looks like gnats flying around. Not a ton of them, but just kind of um, randomly, and they purchase neem oil. Was that a good choice, or how do they kind of address these? Well, if, it depends. If they truly are gnats, you can uh, get a systemic for houseplants. Uh, what you do is you put that in the soil. Um, it will kill the eggs, so it won't get rid of the ones flying. It will kill the eggs, so you won't get more flying, and the ones flying have roughly a nine-day life pattern, so uh, if that's what it truly is as a gnat, that's how you can take care of that. And if you ever have questions about what kind of pests, I know it's hard to catch some of those flying ones on camera, but if you can, um, you know, the ones that are stuck to the foliage, if you want to take a picture and email them to us, we'd be happy to ID them and help you with solutions. So that's always an option too. That makes it much easier so that we're not guessing. We want to make sure you are successful in getting rid of your critters and with the right product. Um, Holly, there's a myth about tap water that plants don't like tap water. Can you talk a little bit about okay. that? Not a myth. A lot of house plants, your carnivorous plants, just house, I just do house plants in general. Our waters have chlorine in it and fluoride. House plants don't need that. They don't want that. Uh, what I do is I let mine sit out for 24 hours and let it evaporate out. Um, can you give us just a few uh, house plants that clean the air better than others? Um, the aloe, aloe vera is one, as well as the fiddle leaf ficus. The mother-in-law snake tongue, the Sansevierias. And the ficus elasticus. And aglaonema would be another. And the philodendron monstera. Um, I know you talked about fertilizing at the beginning and not doing it in the fall and winter. Somebody has a calathea that's starting to crash and is wondering if the fertilizer now would help it or if it would just hurt it even more. That would hurt it even more because it would make it wake up when it doesn't want to. The crashing could be other reasons. Take a picture of it, send it in, and we'll take a look at it. I would like to see the foliage as well as the soil and, uh, and a little brief uh, instruction on how you've been caring for it. Um, we've had some questions about pet friendly houseplants, specifically in regards to cats. Do you have any um, off hands that you know of that are cat friendly? 
Uh, pet friendly would be uh, the Boston fern, the ponytail stump, the spider plant. And that's what I've got with me right now. We do have a section set up. Oh, the Marantas, those are another pet friendly. And we do have a section set up um, with pet friendly plants. So there's more up there than I have down here. Excellent. Um, can you briefly tell us a little bit about the money tree? The, I'm gonna mess up the Latin name. Do you know which one I'm talking about? Yeah. Now, money tree or money plant is a common name for many. There's a pakira that's a money plant. There's an aurelia that's a money plant. This is the palea money plant. This likes to dry completely through. It will get taller. Um, it does get the little spike flower, flowers. Um, it has babies. Those babies can then be planted up and, and given to your friends or something and they like a bright light. What about the Pachara variety? Those, I don't have one on hand. I do have large ones up in the department. Um, those like to be kept moist. Uh, they have an elongated foliage to them. It is a braid that right now the ones I have are about this tall with the foliage on top. And that would be for a bright light area. Um, can you tell us a little bit about watering in the winter for an aloe vera? Aloe like to stay dry for a very long time, uh, depending on what size your pot is, it would depend on when you water as well as the temperature in your house. Uh, my aloe vera, I've got four of them and they're in pots like this. They go a couple months before they get water. So it depends on the pot size and the, the temperature of your home. Um, uh, they need to dry out and stay dry for a while. And how about orchids and watering? Orchids like to dry in between watering as well. You, a lot of people make the mistake of overwatering their orchid. Um, first, you want to start with making sure it's in the proper orchid pot, the proper medium, not in any of those plastic containers. Uh, and then um, you want to make sure those roots dry between watering. Again, uh, orchids are epiphytes. They are meant to sit on the surface of the branching with their roots all exposed to the air. The spathophyllums that you talked about earlier, the peace lilies, um, what kind of light conditions and watering do they like? They like to stay evenly moist and they like a low light situation. They will burn if they're in too bright of a light. And they're beautiful. I have one in my bathroom. It's been there forever. Now, if they stop blooming, that usually means they um, either don't have the nutrients they need or the pot's just ge getting root bound. So you would need to divide them. Easy to divide. You can get in there and see these sections. And those are the sections you would just kind of divide out of there. Again, if you're not sure how to do it, we can teach you or we can do it for you. What about the shamrocks that are houseplants, um, lights and, or light conditions and watering for that? Shamrocks are a little tricky as a houseplant. You will notice that you'll get them in, they're gonna be full, they're gonna quickly grow and then they'll get scraggly. Um, they like an evenly moist foliage, but not sopping wet. They can take a low, depending on which one it is, they can take a low light and some can take a, a bright, indirect bright light. Um, we've got a question about a lipstick plant, um, specifically about the light requirements, but somebody says that theirs doesn't bloom very often and then when it does, the blooms tend to fall off. Do you have any suggestions? Uh, lipsticks like to dry out in between. If the flowers fall right off uh, without having an extended bloom time, chances are you're overwatering. Uh, if they're not blooming, uh, it could be a variety of overwatering or lack of nutrients. They do like a bright light area. Excellent. Um, what about Schefflerus? What kind of light and water do they prefer? 
chefaleras like a bright light. There are quite a large varieties of chefaleras. Um, they like to dry out in between watering. You can see how this one looks like he's kind of nodding a bit rather than upright like he should be. It's kind of dry. <laughs> so that's what that that's what happens. That's it saying to me, okay, I'm ready to bring up some of that water. I'm ready for some water. Uh, like I said, bright light. Let them dry out in between watering. They're very prudable too because they can get bushy. So um, when you prune them, you just go into where there's a crotch and you clip right above that crotch. Um, can you recommend a good systemic product for uh, fungal gnats? Uh, typically we do carry a really nice one, but the warehouses have been out. Uh, any of those, those systemics will work that are for house plants. Um, we hope to get ours in anytime soon. Did you mention the name of that one? Did I miss it? I think it's a Bonade brand. Mm, okay. It just says houseplant systemic. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Um, the money plant that you already kind of talked about, can you, um, let's see, this one says, can you put the heads off money plants if they get too tall? Maybe can you prune them? Um, some of them, this person has long droopy leaves and are wondering why and how to help it. Again, it depends on what the money plant is. If it's the pilea, you can take away any leaves you want. That's not a problem. If it's starting to get leggy over here, get rid of those. You don't need them. It'll grow more. Just don't take them all the, totally away. Um, if it's the Pacura, sometimes you got to remove some of those. They're on a stem with the foliage out here. Sometimes they get broken. Take some of those off. They'll flush out more foliage. If it's the Aurelia stump, the um, Fabian stump, uh, it's, it's a stump. So if you have to cut some of the top off, it'll sprout again. So it just it depends on what kind of money plant you have. We have some questions about Christmas cactus. Um, there, somebody has one right now that has a lot of buds on it. Do they need to do anything special to it right now? And then can Absolutely you Absolutely just... need to. Um, the important thing with zygo cactus is you overwater and all those buds fall off. That's all we get is I had this beautiful zygo cactus that I got from you and all the buds fell off. Well, you yeah, overwatered. They need to dry out between watering. Very important. So besides the watering, there's nothing really to do right now as they're getting ready to bloom? Nope, oh, they're doing their thing. Um, and then one of our last questions here is um, the question about pothos. Are they okay to stay in water instead of soil? I, so I know some people have hydroponically grown them, which is the water. Uh, I, when they are in soil, though, and they stay wet, um, they will rot. Uh, quite often with some of the uh, hydroponics, it depends on your system. Um, I've used an ebb and flow system where the water goes away for a certain amount of time and then it comes back in. So it all depends on, on your system. And if there's some yellow leaves on this pothos that are, um, they seem to be close to the pot itself, what kind of indicator is that? Over water. That's what you said. Yeah. Okay. I think we've covered all the questions. If anything pops up that you didn't get to ask today, or you know, maybe as you're going through some of your house plans or trying to repot or divide, we'd love to help out and answer any questions. Please feel free to reach out. Um, we love to talk about plants, so we'd be happy to discuss yours too. Um, we're really thankful that you spent your morning with us today, and we will be releasing our 2021 class schedule in an uh, somewhere in the next month or so. We'll be starting, I believe, the second weekend in January. So we hope to see you back again. Thanks so much for joining us today, and we'll hope to see you around there. Bye.